Thank you. I want to um, <clears throat> thank Luca for inviting us. I also want to thank him for organizing this, but he should have told me I needed to uh, improve my uh, ability to consume wine and eat late at night. No. <laughs> And maybe we can improve upon it at the, at the next meeting. Also, I, uh, I want to thank both uh, of the two main pharmaceutical companies uh, that, are, that are supporting this, uh, Beringer and Intermune, that, that have funded a lot of our patient advocacy activities. Um, I was a practicing cardiac surgeon for 30 years, uh, <clears throat> probably... Uh, uh, in 1994, I had an aunt that died of pulmonary fibrosis, and then four years later, my father was diagnosed. And uh, is Marvin still here? I don't know if he's, oh, there's Marvin. I, you didn't bark. Uh, <laughs> he took care of my father, and then a year later, my uncle was diagnosed. And, um, and then they got the idea collaboratively to start the foundation in 2000. And uh, I became the CEO in, uh, I, I uh, stopped doing cardiac surgery for a variety of reasons and took over the foundation uh, about three and a half years ago. Um, this kind of just outlines what our main goals, objectives, and mission. Obviously, we like to fund research. It, they're modest grants. Uh, we like to, it, it's important to provide educational activities, both for the patient community and to collaborate with the uh, professional community, such as uh, conferences as this. Uh, it's very important to uh, increase awareness for the disease. I've gone on TV shows, and they say, Dr. Rose, please tell us about cystic fibrosis. And you say, no, no, no. Pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, again, it, 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 we're involved in advocacy efforts, more on kind of a large-scale picture to maintain in the U.S. adequate funding uh, through the NIH and the government, uh, funding through the government to the NIH, the CDC, Department of Defense. And, uh, and with Luca's help, we're, we're trying, to, trying to become international now and um, increase our efforts uh, in Europe as well as other parts of the world. And also, very importantly, is provide support services for the patient community and um, kind of standardize uh, support groups. Kathy will talk about that. And also, uh, Dolly Kravitsky, who's in the audience, really kind of oversees that from a foundation standpoint. Um, I mean, as, as you all well know, the kind of mean survival <clears throat> of patients diagnosed, diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis is two to four years. The incidence seems to be increasing. You probably know better than I do why that is occurring, and the number of mortalities is going up. These are old, uh, this is, uh, these, uh, these are old data from, um, that Amy Olson and the group at uh, National Jewish put together. Interestingly, uh, during that time period, the survival for cystic fibrosis is, has uh, more than doubled. And that, that's really quite impressive. And most of this is directly a result of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So what, what uh, you know, I forget which historian said, but those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's very important lessons that we can learn from the Cystic Fibrosis Organ uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that we can use to partner with the, both the um, uh, professional academic community, uh, the clinical community, and the pharmaceutical community. Uh, and these are the major achievements uh, <clears throat> that uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been in existence probably 55 years. The first 25 years, they really had very little impact on the disease. They hired a new CEO who then got together with his, uh, uh, a number of physicians. There weren't a lot of physicians 30 years ago spending a lot of time on cystic fibrosis and said, you know, listen, how can we have an impact on this disease? How can we deal with this in an intelligent fashion? And the first thing they did was kind of standardize uh, treatment protocols uh, and developed a, a care center network, the CCN, and a, and a patient registry. They also thought that early diagnosis was, was important, um, and, and they improved the uh, screening. Uh, they improved uh, patient and family education, and this included uh, providing uh, good uh, respiratory care and nutritional care. They would go to the care centers, and if they didn't have the resources, they would provide the uh, respiratory therapists and nutritional counseling, and, and they educated the families on the importance of this. They also uh, really looked at targeted drug development 
and, and did this in a very uh, kind of stepwise fashion, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And also, uh, you know, they knew that there were genetic defects and they got involved early on in the discovery of the genes uh, that were responsible for, for cystic fibrosis. And going back 30 years ago, there was not a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical company in spending a lot of dollars on the development of drugs for cystic fibrosis. So they had the resources, they were a, a real dynamic fundraising organization, but they started to use the, those dollars much more wisely. They, initially there were 10 care centers. Now that this is in the U.S., I'm not sure of the international numbers, but there are 150, there are 150 care centers and there are 54 affiliate centers. For example, I live in Connecticut. The closest uh, care centers are either in, uh, in New Haven or in New York City. There's one in Stanford, Connecticut, which is about 30 miles from New York City. They're affiliated with the, uh, with the care center network at Columbia. So the kids don't have to travel long distances. And it's the same thing, you know, a lot of you may have patients that are, you know, hundreds of miles or kilometers away. So if we could create kind of affiliate networks so the patients wouldn't have to travel with internet technologies and stuff, this is very, very feasible. Uh, they uh, designated certain research centers initially to do a lot of the research. Uh, as I said, they standardized treatments, and then they were able to assess the long-term outcomes uh, with the registry. Again, some of the data that we heard uh, that presented in the last couple of days, if we really had a good international registry, we might be farther ahead in our understanding uh, the effects of, of some of the treatments that are in place. And they did this, uh, they have 70 chapters in, in the United States and, and, and the chapters help increase, increase the awareness. They communicate with the care center networks and uh, they also help raise funds. Uh, and these are just, I'm sure you're all aware of these, but these are drugs that were developed in collaboration with the foundation, Pulmozyme, uh, you know, which is a very strong mucolytic that actually is used in some transplant patients. They developed the two inhaled antibiotics, Toby and Kasten, and most recently, uh, Kaleidico. And we were talking about this in our group. And these are, you know, Kaleidico is only for 4 or 5% of patients with CF. But, you know, and again, I think that this is a problem that Marvin brought up in our session is, you know, we're treating all the patients the same in the, in the drug trials, and maybe they all behave, or they behave somewhat differently. And, and, and we need to have better biomarkers to know uh, who we should be treating with what, what, with what agents. So how can we achieve this in the pulmonary fibrosis community? And I think it's, we, we try and replicate what was done in the cystic fibrosis. Again, you know, we talked about this in our session, and as I'm sure many of you, do we really need to kind of come up with a consensus statement uh, about what type of research to do? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'm not gonna, I, I, I think it's an interesting question, and, and I think it's for people that are more knowledgeable than I am. Certainly we can ad advocate uh, to maintain adequate research funding, because I think that that's critically important. Again, the discussion that we, we had, we need better myo biomarkers to uh, predict uh, so we can risk stratify the patients, so we can enroll patients in clinical trials more intelligently and also perhaps target therapies is, I don't know if Sheila's not in the room now, but uh, you know, as, as she discussed this morning. Uh, I think it's critically important to have academic industry uh, collaborations that are completely transparent, but with the decrease in research funding, I think uh, uh, it becomes more and more important, and I think there have been a couple of examples, both with the uh, the STX100 and uh, and some of the newer uh, therapies uh, in the pipeline. How how important these collaborations are. It's also, I think, very very important to establish a registry and care center network. And I think we can these these things are very expensive to do. And as the uh, physician from Australia indicated they were able to do this in Australia with the collaboration of the pharmaceutical industry. So again, this is you know, something that we're in the early stages of developing and discussing. Again, it's, uh, it's very important. The patient community is, is deeply interested in participating in the disease and in, in helping find a cure. And again, we as an advocacy organization can help uh, recruit patients into clinical trials where appropriate. The CF Foundation has this huge database, and when they want to do a clinical trial, they can just go to the computer and say, you know, these patients may be eligible, and then they have a, a very uh, 
you know, candid uh, and, and, and open discussion with him. It's also, again, this disease, uh, <clears throat> you know, someone had the picture, I don't know if it was Martin Kolb or whomever that had the picture of uh, Marlon Brando and Evil Knievel, and we're not sure about Jerry Lewis. They included Jerry Lewis. But there's, there's plenty of well-known people that have died uh, from the disease. But again, through creating uh, affiliate chapters, uh, we can increase the awareness of the disease and also raise funds. And, and finally, advocacy. I think it's, it's critically important, and, and we formed a consortium in the U.S. with the other patient advocacy groups, the American Thoracic Society, and with an entity called Research America to aggressively uh, advocate for uh, continued funding for the NIH, uh, uh, the CDC, and the Department of Defense. And I think that that's my last slide. Oh, no, this is the last slide. Again, finally, it's you need a collaboration amongst all these different entities. And we feel that the foundation, if we kind of maintain our integrity and, and independence, we can get everyone to work together. And I think through a, through a really joint collaborative uh, effort, we can, we can find and, and help develop better uh, treatments. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dan. Thanks.